Well, good morning. If you take your Bible, will you turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy chapter 3. I want to read for us verses 14 to 16. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. And I just want to say, we love you. Uh, we're so thankful to see you today. We're thankful for the invitation uh, to be here and even meet people that we didn't know. Uh, we count you as our fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters in the faith. And we often thank God for how you have served us and ministered to us over the years. And so from my family, uh, we just want to say thank you for your ministry to us and that we love you very much. So let's hear from God and his word. I'll read again from chapter 3, verses verses 1, I'm sorry, verses 14 to 16. And as I read, will you hear with me the word of our Lord? I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Will you pray with me? Blessed are you, O Lord. We pray that you would this day teach us your word deal graciously and bountifully with us. Father, we're your servants. So teach us your words so that we may live, that we may hold fast to your truth, and that the world may know that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. So you're in a series, Letters to the Churches. And you are looking about how to do life as a church again in light of what's happened to most of us, except in Florida, we decided not to have COVID. <laughs> you're learning to do life again as a church, and you're looking at Paul's letters to the churches to reorient you. And so for that, I am thankful. What's going on here? I mean that here, but I also mean in the text. Well, according to the Bible, we are in the last days, the final days of the power of darkness and the end of sin's tyranny, the end of man's rebellion, the end of Satan's deception, and the end of death's sting. So by Jesus' incarnation, his cross, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection, he came and established his kingdom, and he brought new days. But these days overlap with the last days. The new days have already begun. And so, brothers and sisters, we have the life of God by the Spirit of God. God has forgiven us of our sins and counted us righteous for Christ's sake. He's made us new. And yet, we're still feeling the, the old days of our battle with indwelling sin the suffering of our bodies as with our brother and sister Franklin and Gertrude. But yet Christ has initiated never ending days, life and peace with God. And so there's this overlap between the old and the new and now we live there in that flux and in that conflict. But the enemy still has a fight even though the death blow has been dealt by Christ's cross the enemy still has fight left in him. Like the poisonous bite of a dead serpent, he still rages. And God is still saving sinners. He's still giving new life to those dead in their trespasses and sin. And we see in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in, in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. That is, 
People will leave the gospel they once professed to believe. They will depart the Christian faith, the death, burial, and resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus to save sinners. They will abandon Jesus himself and trade him away for other pleasures and other loves, for conveniences and other concerns. People will abandon Jesus and they will abandon the church. And this is what we too live in. This is the setting for this letter. Paul writes this letter and he's concerned about this church and he's concerned about them holding fast to the gospel of Jesus, holding that gospel up to the world and living lives in light of that gospel because people will desert Jesus, and they're doing so in this congregation. And notice the situation with me. So we'll think about, as we sort of analyze this letter a bit, we'll think about the situation of this letter and our own situation living in the last days. We will also look at the symptoms, the, the problems that, that they're leaving the gospel caused in this local church. And then, and then we'll finally think about the solution that God has given us in his word as we too live in these last days. Notice the situation. The situation is there is a drift that demanded action. The church was drifting from the gospel. Verse one of chapter four, we've read this just a moment ago, some will depart from the faith. The gospel ship of this congregation is being wrecked against the rocks of false teaching. The boat that once held the gospel for all those drowning sinners in the city of Ephesus was beginning to sink. All hands on deck are needed and Paul acts. He warned the church years ago in Acts chapter 19 that that wolves would creep in and come from among those leaders of the church. He warned them to be on guard and to watch over their own souls and to watch over the flock of God. Paul had already excommunicated two of these church leaders. If you look at chapter one, verse 19, chapter one, verse 19, we read, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. But, but friends, others crept in and arose among that congregation. By their teaching, they were tearing apart Christian families, and they were tearing down God's household, the pillar and support of the truth of God's salvation in Christ. So Paul sends his best man in. You know, it's like a one-man special ops unit. He sends Timothy on a mission. And he sends him to silence false teachers and preach the gospel and encourage the church to live in light of this gospel. This is nothing less for Paul and Timothy than war. Uh, Notice the language he employs in chapter one, verse 18. This this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child in accordance with these prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Or look at the end of the book, chapter six, verse 12. Chapter six, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. These false teachers had deviated from the truth of the gospel and their mouths had wandered into empty and fruitless speculations. They were a distraction rather than an encouragement. Silly talk about Jewish myths and stories and theories about Old Testament genealogies. That was part and parcel of their ministry. And all the while they were diverting the people from the gospel of Christ. Notice chapter four, verse seven. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Or chapter one, verse four. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. And they prided themselves in being teachers of the law, but Paul says in chapter one, they don't have a clue what the law says or how to teach it. 
Friends, they were motivated by pride, they were marked by theological ignorance and a craving for more. You see this in chapter six. If you look over at chapter six with me, verse three, he says, teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Oh yeah, they love the dollar. But friends, something more sinister lies under their so-called ministries. The evil one, the evil one is lurking in the shadows and he loves nothing more than to poison the church's diet to give them a trade-off, a false gospel, to get us distracted or tempted to talk about all kinds of stuff happening out there and not concerned with the only message that saves sinners. It's like he's activated a sleeper cell in this congregation. And now while some have left the church, some have been excommunicated, some have stayed in the church, But they left the gospel a long time ago. Their whole being was devoted, he says, to the teaching of demons. And whether they realized it or not, friends, Satan was operating in the church. I wonder if you ever think how Satan might be working here among you in your dissensions, in your conflicts, in your distractions. Well, he is, but, but God has given the church away. (laughs) Notice some things about this teaching quickly before we look at the effects that this teaching had on the church. Well, first, it was different than the gospel that the apostles gave the church and that gave life to dead sinners. It it was Bible-like, but bible light. Bible-like, there's some religious words, let's talk about the law, look at those genealogies, but what about this, what about that? It was Bible-like, but it was bible light. There was no substance of Christ and gospel and grace and wrath and hope and forgiveness and righteousness and a new heaven and a new earth and the return of the Lord Jesus and how we live as Christians in light of that reality. It was a substitute. You see this in chapter one, verse three. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Look at verse seven. These people are desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they say or the the things about which they make confident assertions. It's Bible-like, but it is Bible-light. It is a different doctrine. It's really a system of works. It is do this and gain that from God. Do this and experience this from God. And Paul says they don't even know what the law is about. Notice verse eight. He says, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just. God did not give his law to a bunch of righteous people, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Do you see what Paul just did there as he talks about the law? Brothers and sisters, he just opened up our hearts and by God's law for sinners, diagnosed our condition as deviant and dead and in need of forgiveness and life. And so the law exposes our need, our sin, all of us in all of its facets. Now you may pick a couple of sins out there and you say, hey, I really don't like those sins. Those are the really bad guys. 
But liars? Really? The unholy? Come on. The disobedient? You see how we all find ourselves here? But friends, notice what Paul does then. He reminds Timothy of the gospel that he must be giving to these people. Look at what he says in verse 12. He says, I thank him who has given me strength. Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointed me to his service, though formerly I, (laughs) notice him raising the hand of confession, formerly I, a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me. What did grace bring Paul? It brought him faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. And so he says, listen, the, tr- the saying is trustworthy. This statement that all the churches know He repeats it for Timothy, for the congregation there that Timothy is serving. He says, this statement is trustworthy, deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Brothers and sisters, and here we have the gospel. Christ came to save sinners all kinds like you and me to forgive us, to bring us righteousness, to deliver us from our sin and rebellion and the wrath of God that rested upon us. Friend, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, this is good news for you. That God in mercy and love sent Christ to live the life you should have lived but could not and would not, to die the death under the curse of God that you deserve. And not only did he die, he died and satisfied God's wrath. He was the perfect sacrifice. He lived the holy life. He obeyed the law. He kept it to the full gladly and happily. And God raised him from the dead. Jesus has ascended to the throne of his father. And now he has declared to sinners everywhere, commanded them to repent If that's you today and you're not a Christian, you don't know the forgiveness of sins and new life and peace with God, then friend, find a neighbor. (laughs) Find the person in the pew next to you, Kelton or Paul or Elliot or whoever you can find and, and ask them. They would be happy to tell you more of this good news. But notice, when you trade good news for poison, it begins to affect the body, the household of Christ. So look with me at some of the symptoms. Some of the symptoms of this false teaching, that is, it had begun to take root. There's no longer gospel being preached. There's other stuff being talked about. It's whatever is on the the newspaper cover. That's the issue we need to deal with. And the consequences of this doctrinal gangrene were serious for this congregation. If it's not exposed, this false gospel and false teaching, if it's not countered, the gangrene will spread. It will breed rot and decay in this church. And the church is beginning to see this in some of its limbs. By false teaching and heresy, I mean preaching that avoids or neglects or ignores the gospel of Jesus Christ preaching that perverts or distorts or adds to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have a concern. I have a concern that many pastors and and many churches are Bible-like and bible light. But friends, there is no gospel. Notice what happens when a congregation goes this way. The pulpit becomes a place for promotion of opinions and speculations rather than the preaching of the gospel of God that saves. That's what he says, silence these false teachers. <laughs> They're using the pulpit for anything and everything. It's interesting that the, the rot is happening with the corporate worship itself. So that's what Paul takes on first. Silence these people. The gospel of Christ's death and resurrection and the salvation that Jesus accomplished for sinners by it, for all kinds of sinners, the least and the worst of them was no longer the Sunday morning diet. Notice what else is happening. Congregational prayer is waning. Prayer for all kinds of people. It's being neglected and ignored. 
You get that in verse two of chapter two? Look at verse one. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for all kinds of people, for kings and, and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. What happened? Well, the prayer meeting got replaced by an anger management group. It had been replaced, really, no longer managing their anger by quarreling and shouting. You notice down in verse 8, chapter 2, I desire that in every place men should pray. (laughs) It's good to pray. Pray. Pray for all kinds of people. God wants to save all kinds of people. And especially pray for your leaders. Pray, pray. And they're fighting. Given the context of verse 2, pray for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Maybe, maybe the men were upset and arguing about policies and politics and presidents. Why do you think there's a reluctance for the church to pray for their leaders. Regardless, rather than speaking to God for the souls of men, all kinds of men, or speaking to men about the gospel of God, these guys are turning corporate worship into a royal rumble. And when, when the truth is not front and center, friends, prayer, not only the gospel, but prayer will recede into the corner of the church. For some of the women, the church's worship had become an opportunity for performance and pageantry. They've traded godliness for good looks. Look at at verse 9. Likewise also that the women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Well... Within the church, there seemed to be a resentment that began to grow against certain kinds of people. Maybe even with certain kinds of sins that are not like our kinds of sins. And you see it in verse two, especially with government leaders. You know, let's just be honest. At times, the government can make it really hard to be a Christian. Government can make it hard to be a citizen. Just ask Paul or just ask our brothers and sisters in Nigeria whose children at the Baptist high school were kidnapped. Just ask them about an incompetent government who can't keep order in a society. When order and peace give way, to kidnappings and church burnings and and persistent persecution. That's a problem for Christians, isn't it? But rather than praying for those in authority so that order and peace would be restored, would prevail, and rather than seeking the salvation of all kinds of people, especially those in authority, it seems that respect and prayer for the governing leadership was waning. So he can just say, does that sound familiar? That is what our Lord is teaching us here. We're to pray for our leaders, that they would be converted, that they would lead with wisdom, that they would do what is right, that they would promote order and well-being for our nation. We're to pray especially for them when they're not doing these things, and we're to keep praying for them when they are. Paul probably writes during the reign of Nero, notoriously wicked and incompetent ruler. So for Paul, regardless of who is in power, peace and order is what we pray for so that Christians can spread the gospel. I'm so thankful that we did that this morning. Do not give that up. Well, lastly, let me land this plane. So what's the solution? 
The solution is very simple. It is godly conduct and gospel confession. The solution Paul gives is godly conduct and gospel confession. Godly conduct. Conduct yourselves as God's church, as his family, his pillar of truth in the world. That's his message. As God's church, you must pray for all kinds of people, right? That's how we conduct ourselves as God's family. As God's church, we pray for all kinds of people. As God's church, his household of faith, the, 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 the only entity on planet earth that's charged with holding up the gospel, lots of organizations and lots of entities and lots of people hold up all kinds of things, some of them very good, some of them very bad. But brothers and sisters, the church has been tasked with holding up only the gospel. That is the flag that we fly. And so we hold it up. And, and we take care of one another when we have legitimate needs. If you notice over in chapter five, he says, take care of the widows who are, who are truly widows. If your family, if, if, if you have a widow in your family, you family, you take care of her so that it's not a burden, a financial burden on the church. But if there's no one, there's a need and there's no one, church, you step in and you care for this need sacrificially, radically, persistently. Why, why does he say this? And then why does he go on in chapter five to say, hey, take care of your family too. <laughs> you provide for your family. Take care of your own household. Why? Well, brothers and sisters, we often forget that our lives as Christians, though not the gospel, our lives as Christians come in the gospel. And so as we take care of those in need in the congregation, as we regularly support them and provide for them, as we take care of our own families to the best of our ability, we are, we are commending this message to others. And then he says about our conduct, learn to be content. Learn to be content and you beware of the religion of prosperous morality. A little Jesus sprinkled on a whole lot of personal and financial ambition. You major in contentment and generosity. Notice chapter six, the end of this book. Verse six, we read, now there is great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But, but if we have food and clothes with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Beware of that kind of religion, a prosperous morality that lacks contentment even with the little bit that God has provided for you. Well, our conduct matters. It's not the gospel, but it calls attention to the gospel. So godly conduct, and lastly then, the solution is gospel confession. Guard and give the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you look at chapter three, that's what we see, right? As we read, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up into glory. You remember Paul's statement, Christ Jesus, the trustworthy saying is Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So as God's church, we can never assume the gospel. Did you catch, did you catch what happened this morning? We read the good news of Jesus Christ. You heard the good news of Jesus Christ. We prayed about the good news of Jesus Christ. We sang about the good news of Jesus Christ. We will conclude with the good news of Jesus Christ. We can't ever assume the gospel. We must always have it and hold it and confess it and remind each other of it together in this setting, but also when we separate.
Pastors in particular play an important role in this work. In fact, we should follow Timothy's lead and Paul's command. Elders, as Paul deals with them, you are to set the believers an example of how to follow Jesus. That's part of your ministry in this congregation. You are to devote yourself to reading the scripture as was done this morning publicly for the congregation, to exhorting and teaching as Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 13. You are to remember God's call to serve this church and continue to preach and continue to pray, continue to love, continue to be immersed in God's work and God's word. Not only are you elders who oversee the sheep of God, but you must persist in watching over your own soul. Paul says to Timothy, keep a, keep a close watch on your life and your doctrine. By doing so, you will save yourself and your hearers. And so you, like Timothy, elders, you have a sacred trust, a charge from God to keep the gospel pure and untainted, unstained by counterfeits and and well poisons. By the grace of God, live above reproach in your home, elders, and in Christ's church, and in the world, and hold high the gospel before your people. But brothers, pastors, elders here, as you do this, remember that this is not your flock. All of these souls have been purchased by the good shepherd at the cost of his own life. And so this is not your flock, it's your family. So treat older men like fathers. Treat older women like mothers. Treat younger women like sisters in all purity. Treat younger men like brothers. And as you bring God's word to them, even in difficult seasons, do so with respect and love. Don't shepherd sheep like you chase off wolves. You make that mistake and you will hurt the people of God. Deacons, your ministry may seem unnoticed here and overlooked, but Paul has a word for you. You're like the spirit-applied glue that maintains the unity of this congregation. Your zeal, your joy in serving the church, your labor And loving these people and caring helps to keep and cultivate the unity of this congregation. It commends the gospel to the watching world. Deacons were some of the first to be persecuted in the second century. And in case you've forgotten, there's a promise to you. For those who serve well as deacons, you gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Well, Let's conclude with a moment of silence. And as we do, I want to read for you one last passage for you to meditate on. And by the strengthening grace of God, may you hold fast to Christ personally and as a congregation. May you hold up the gospel of God's grace to this community until our Lord Jesus returns. Hear these final words from chapter six, verses 13 to 16. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who is his, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen.